welcome everybody back here at uh, Siegel Talks at the Martini Siegel Theater Center at the Graduate Center CUNY in New York City in Manhattan at the City University and uh, uh, another day uh, in New York and uh, it's uh, summer, it's hot, it's uh, almost tropical here and um, and uh, we are still inside uh, that catastrophe movie where the uh, uh, reality is uh, stranger than fiction and we are part of it. It's like a, an absurdist Witkiewicz play or something. And, um, and we, we are still really, really in the middle of it. Uh, there again, 60 or 1,000 infections yesterday and the Center for Disease Control says most probably the number of people who are infected is 13 times higher. So the th 3.7 million are confirmed. That means actually 40 million people most probably in the United States. It's, it, numbers are stunning and shocking. It's the most in the world and, um, and uh, we uh, have to see where this all is leading. We have a, 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 such a strange, weak and irresponsible government. Uh, there's a deep distrust. Uh, people are out of job over the time. 40, over 40, 45 million applied for, um, for job endurance. Uh, they lost their jobs. New York City lost 1 million jobs. Restaurants are closing, stores are closing. If you go down to the streets, it's empty. Um, a friend who lives uh, close to 8th Avenue and 36th Street says, you know, uh, people who are released from prison are in all the hotels. The city bought the hotels out from 32nd Street to 56. People are outside, big groups, 40, 50 people on lawn chairs. He's like, people I'm not safe. I can go there. And uh, people who were protected from Corona or maybe already had it. Nobody knows. They have to all be, have a curfew. You have to be back at five or six. So it's a, uh, it's a quite a, a strange time you live in. And then the scenes in Portland, there's for good reason, several unrest on the streets and the whole Black Lives Matter movement galvanized it. But uh, now the Homeland Security Forces, as someone said, it looks like a fascism for TV, for live TV. You know, they are moving in. It's a, a unprecedented times we go through. Nobody knows what's going on. And, uh, and but what we do um, is uh, to talk to people where we think who always experience uh, life and the present, anticipate the future on the right side of social justice, on the right side of the complex fight for liberties uh, and freedom. And these are artists. And in our case, these are theater artists and we should listen to them much, much closer what is on their mind, what they think about. And um, because um, it is uh, of significance and might help us, our lives, the city, the country you're in, to really think through what, what is it uh, all about. Today, um, we have with us um, another significant uh, uh, writer who is, uh, 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 has been at the Siegel before, and he is, uh, how would one say, is part of the landscape of uh, New York uh, City theater. It's Carl Hancock Rax, and he is an American poet, playwright, novelist, essayist, actor, director, singer, and songwriter. He authored many books and uh, got an OB award for his play uh, Talk, which is what he is also very much known for. He has four CDs recorded uh, to his credit and he has been supported by the Doris Duke Foundation, Doris Duke Award. He got the Bessie Award and uh, many, many things on. He is a visiting artist at uh, Yale uh, University and importantly, he's an associate director at the Mabu Mines Theater. And we, anybody who had the time and listened uh, to Lee Brewer and Maud uh, uh, just uh, um, uh, last week knows what this uh, great theater, this great work um, um, is about with the great Ruth Malachak, who we lost already earlier, who also often was uh, uh, visiting us. Uh, so um, Carl, thank you, thank you, thank you for joining. Um, big honor to have you uh, with us. And I apologize for um, my uh, lengthy speech. We, we also, we also, it's about listening, but then I can start talking, talking. But uh, hope you will forgive me, Kyle. Where, where are you now? And uh, normally I say what time it is, but I guess is you're somewhere close. Right. Uh, so I'm, I'm in New York City. So I'm in the same city I think that you're in, right? Because you're, yeah. you're in. Yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm in New York City. I'm in Brooklyn. I live in Fort Greene. Um, what street? Uh, Carl and Carlton. So I'm on Carlton Avenue. Very strange. That that was that was a coincidence. That that wasn't by, uh, that wasn't planned. Uh -huh. um, 
and so yeah, I'm so I'm, I'm so I'm not far from the Brooklyn Academy of Music, and you know that that whole area. Yeah. Mm. Wow. So, home. so, how how is it going from how how are you experiencing this time? In in many ways, I mean, it's it's a it's a very interesting time. It's just, it's very dystopian, um, and in in a in a in a strange way, um, the dystopian is not unfamiliar to me. You know, uh, it, it's in fact it endear you know something about dystopian times have always fascinated me, uh, uh, whether they were real or imagined. You know, um, I. I, I, my particular neighborhood is very charming. Uh, it's, it's always charming. It's always sort of a hip, you know, neighborhood with lots of restaurants and bars and things like that. But because of this coronavirus, a lot of restaurants have been, uh, you know, seating outside. So there are lots of people who are, you know, seating outside. Uh, and there are lots of, um, and the bars you are not allowed to walk into. So the the bars are uh, serving from the doors or from windows, uh, you know, right to the street, to the patrons on the street. So it feels very much like a cross between New Orleans and Paris right now, which is, which is kind of nice, uh, you know? I mean, it's almost like I wish that um, there are some things, I was thinking about this and I was thinking that there are some things that have happened during quarantine, or at least during this sort of pandemic, uh, that sort of changed cultural and social norms that I wish will never go back to the way it used to be, you know, to the formal way that it used to be. I think I actually really, I really love the idea that everybody, especially in the summer, is out on the street, you know, and that everybody's meeting and, you know, and that and we're all, you know, everybody's together and, and no one seems segregated, you know, in their, in their, in their, own, in their own way. Um, of course, everyone is in masks and everyone is social distancing um, uh, and that's important. But, um, but there's a, a, a Yeah, it looks like we lost audio for a second. Um, I, I, I can't not, oh, my audio? Now you're back, can you say again the last sentence, yeah. Oh yeah, I was just going to say, I can't say that um, at this moment, I should say at this moment, my neighborhood is quite charming. I mean, the weather's hot, but beautiful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, and the people are out on the streets and, you know, congregating, you know? Mm. Um, there, there's something about danger. There's something about danger that brings people together. I remember New York City during the 9-11 moment uh, and everybody came out of their houses uh, and, and it forced people to talk to each other and to meet each other. Uh, and, and, and this is doing the same in a way, even though we're social, socially distancing, it's forcing people to kind of come together. So there's something about these kinds of tragedies that affect all of our lives that force us to communicate and to have interaction with each other in ways in which we normally don't. Because especially in cities like New York City, uh, where um, it's a very crowded city, it's a very busy city, and people tend to be, um, you know, in their own bubbles. They're, they tend to be, you know, all sort of on their own paths and, you know, barely have time to say hello, you know, or to stop and to sit and to talk. And right now there's a lot of sitting and stopping and talking. And I, that is, that's the world that I thrive in. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, so, um, so where were you when it started, when it happened? And... I was, I was here, I was here, I was here, I was here in New York City. I was here in Brooklyn. Um, I was, uh, you know, the, 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 the period of quarantine when everyone had to remain in their homes was very different from what I'm explaining right now, because you know I, it, it it was around March, and so uh, it got darker early. The weather was still a little cold. Uh, the the streets were vacant for the most part. Um, you know, it, it was so quiet that it was uh, eer eerily quiet, eerily quiet, mm -hmm. um, and 
uh, I just and I just remained in the house for the most part, uh, which, thank God, knock on wood, has kept me um, pretty safe. Now, I I then found myself forced to join the world or to go outside, and I don't mean just for the normal things that one goes outside for, like shopping or things like that, but when the when the Black Lives Matter when the Black Lives Movement matter when the Black Lives Matter movement, sorry, when the Black Lives Matter movement started, I was getting a lot of calls and, 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 and I also felt compelled to join, you know, that protest and to, and to, and to be a part of it. And so um, I, you know, I, I threw caution to the wind, I wore my mask and I went out and I, and I, and I marched with people. So I was there marching as well during the quarantine. Um, and then in Bed-Stuy, Brooklyn, there was a the, the, fir the first mural that was painted in New York City, the Black Lives Matter mural that was painted here. Uh, I was asked to inaugurate it uh, at the unveiling. And so I, I spoke at that and, and, and I went there and the press was there. And uh, so that, that, that's, that, those, those have been my sort of outdoor activities for the most what part. What did you say? What did you say? Um, well, one of the things I was saying was that um, letting people know, first, I was explaining what I, what I think Black Lives Matter means, because I think there's a lot of confusion around that. I think there's a lot of confusion or, or misunderstanding around like what, what, the, what, the, what, the, what, the, what, the, what the phrase itself, itself means. There's this idea that if, if, if it, there's an idea that the phrase Black Lives Matter means no other lives matter. And that's not true. You know, the, the, the phrase, um, you know, is basically saying, please pay attention to the fact that black and brown people have been dis disproportionately um, abused and, 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 and suffering a certain kind of brutality and sudden death at the hands of a uh, police force in this country. Um, an authoritarian rule in a way that other lives have not. And we need to pay attention to, um, you know, we need to pay attention to this. It's no different than saying, save the whales. It doesn't mean that no other fish in the sea matter. It doesn't mean that none of the other fish matter. It means that, you know, the, the way the, that the whales are endangered. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. so, uh, so we're speaking about, you know, an endangered species of humanity and um, it's, and, and if we can understand that, if we, if we can understand save the whales, if we can understand um, save the snow leopards, if we can understand, you know, save a species of bird, if we can understand to, um, saving a species of plant, uh, if we can understand saving a tree, then why can, we, why can we not understand, um, you know, saving a species of humanity? And, and that's what the Black Lives Matter movement is really about. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing I spoke about very clearly was uh, when they painted the mural was that, um, was that I wanted the people in that community to treat that mural as if it were sacred ground, uh, as if it were a, uh, 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 and, it, and it is a totem to all the lives that have been lost and all the lives that may be threatened in the future um, to allow it to allow to allow the painting not to be marred or or you know ruined in any way um, but but to, but to revere it to revere it with a certain kind of you know um, you know honor if, if you will uh, you know to really to honor it and that became almost prophetic, right, which is very interesting right now, because in New York City, we, you know, in the last few days, we've been dealing with uh, people destroying, you know, the Black Lives Matter murals, like the one outside of the Trump Plaza, um, the one, and then they hit the one in Brooklyn as well, that I was, uh, that, that I inaugurated. Um, I think they've also thrown paint or destroyed the one in Harlem. Uh, from what I understand, these are, uh, pro-Trump pro supporters, make lives, make, uh, make America great again, you know, enthusiasts and whatever. So um, 
it, it, it really brings home the fact that, that we are in a, we are in a, we are in a divided country right now. And not only are we in a divided country and a, and a divided moment, but we have someone at the helm of this country who is actually antagonizing and further advocating that divisiveness. And, uh, you know, it, it, it sort of brings it all home to me in a very clear way that we need to recover um, the damage that has been done over the last four years by this administration, but certainly, even more importantly, the damage that has been done over the last 200 years since, you know, the, the founding of this country. And um, we need to deal with the damage that has been done to our psyche, um, to our social understanding of who we are, to our language and how we define each other, to how we perceive each other, to our realms of love and hatred and tolerance and intolerance um, and education. You know, we, we really have been damaged and, and, and in, in, in so many ways. And so there's so much work for America and not just America, but for the world to do psychically, intellectually, spiritually. So um, this, this moment is, I think, bring that to everyone's minds. I, I, I would like to think that it's bringing it to everyone's minds. And that's what I've been focused on. Yeah, no, this is, uh, it is a stunning moment and we are too close, I think, even to really understand and we, even with these talk, we're trying to catch a little bit of that reality about this for everybody. And uh, I mean, at the one day in April, it was over 800 dead people. New York City, now, luckily, has now five or six days without without a corona related death, but in the corona neighborhood, funny enough, as by the name in Queens, up to 70% people had it. Uh, people who are on the fringes a bit more of the city, the disenfranchised, the minorities. So it's a, an X-ray um, of, 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 of the world we live in, actually, as you said, we all in bubbles, but... Uh, and then within that, within that, you know, we're, we're also living with the fact that even with the coronavirus, um, Black and brown bodies or, or black people are disproportionately, uh, you know, affected. You know, there's a higher rate of people who are actually dying from the yeah. virus, um, and those people are black. And it's not because of melanin. It's not because you know mm -hmm. that they've got this complexion, but it's 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 because of uh, pre-existing, from from what I think I understand, pre-existing conditions um, mm -hmm. that you know um, really make the the, the pandemic or, or make the virus, um, you know, life-threatening. And so, you know, everything from high blood pressure to mm -hmm. diabetes and, and all of those things. And so that brings home, so it's, so, it's, so it's like, in one way, we've got all, we've got hundreds of thousands of people who are dying, but then we've got all these black people who are dying disproportionately, mm -hmm. you know, from the virus, you know, yeah. and then you've got all these people who are dying at the hands of police brutality. And then you've got, um, uh, you know, uh, the threat of your, you know, your own, your own health, your own safety, you know, that you're, that you're, that, you know, that, that one is concerned about whether you're black or white or whatever you, one considers oneself, you know, um, and, 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 and trying to find uh, peaceful ways to shelter at home and people who are uh, finding that very difficult. And then of course, the, the, the complications that come with, that come with sheltering at home for some people. Uh, we've seen Divorce rates, we've seen divorce rates go up. We've seen, um, you know, families uh, really have to reckon with each other in ways that they had not before uh, because mm -hmm. they're spending so much time with each other. Um, there is no theater, there is no film, uh, you know, there, there's no, there, there's, there's, there are no outlets, there's no place to go to. So we're living, you know, we're living in a, we're living in a very strange moment, but it's not a moment that is it is, it, is, it is a moment unlike any other moment that I've lived in, but I must say that it's not unlike other moments in history. There, there have been moments like this. You know, there have been moments of quarantine. There have been moments of pandemic. There have been moments 
of uh, upheaval. You know, there have been moments of, um, you know, you know, public safety being threatened. You know, uh, we we we've, you know, we we you know, we've we've gone through it. We 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 we've, we've read about it. We've we've learned it in school, and now we are actually in the throes of it. And so, uh, even in, in in that way, it makes me understand that this moment is not new. You know, this moment is not new. You know, pandemics are not new. You know, there have been pandemics, you know, for centuries, and there have been people who, yeah, there have been plagues and black plagues, so-called, you know, irony that it would be called the black plague, right? Yeah. But there have, been, there, there have been black plagues and uh, um, all kinds of, you know, viruses and, and things where, where people just love people dying left and right. In my lifetime, I've lived through, uh, I guess, obviously, the last huge, I mean, I'm, I know there was a Zara's pandemic prior to this, but somehow I don't know that I took that as seriously, but I would say the last pandemic that I took as seriously as this one was um, the AIDS pandemic, you know, and how it was affecting people and how it, affect, how it affected people's social lives, how it affected people's sex lives, how it, affect, how it affected people's um, sense of intimacy um, uh, and culture. Uh, so having survived just a few, a fraction, a small fraction of pandemics in my life, um, and having survived um, just a few, a fraction of uh, administrations that I find distasteful um, and, and also personally threatening to my life and to my way of life and to, uh, and to the arts and to the economy. Um, I'm aware that if I were 300 years old, none of this would seem incredibly new that you know, mm -hmm. that I would be aware of the fact that the world has gone through these cycles again and again and again and again. And for some reason, still has not learned the lessons that it needs to learn. I mean, there is no lesson that we need to learn that's ever going to change the fact that pandemics will come and go. There's no lesson that we're going to learn that's going to, um, you know, I think ever uh, prevent pandemics, you know, from, from ever happening. But there are lessons about how to get through them uh, that we can learn from the past. There are lessons that we need to learn about police brutality. There are lessons that we need to learn about culture. There are lessons that we need to learn about racism. There are lessons that we need to learn about sheltering. There are lessons that we need to learn about ourselves and about our families. So, um, and you know, how to, how to uh, repair ourselves and check in with ourselves and be very clear that, um, that Sometimes we're, we're, we're running too fast, um, doing too much and not slowing down enough, you know, that we're living in an Epicurean kind of, um, we're, living in a, uh, we're living in an Epicurean cultural existence that, 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 um, that distracts us from the things that are more important. Um, so I think that we, I think this is a, this is almost like the universe it's almost like the universe is literally telling everybody to sit down, shelter, think, and uh, meditate, and face yourself. You know, look at look at yourself, deal with yourself, look at each other, and um, figure out who you are social, socially, politically, culturally, um, and, and of course physically. Mm. Yeah. How was it for you? Um, did, were you able to write or meditate or sing? How did you spend the days and the, as an artist? How was it? Well, as an artist, I'm, I tend to be a um, a homebody, you know, as a writer especially. So this is not that hard for me, to be honest. Um, I'm I'm used to uh, being in the house and to writing, and so yes, I have been able to write, and it's been wonderful. Um, it's, it's been terrific, and and I've been. I've been researching a lot and I've been going through, um, you know, pages and pages and pages of, uh, you know, documents and things regarding other periods in time. I've also, uh, like I said, other than my work with the Black Lives Matter movement, um, I've also been working with, you know, trying to figure out how to keep, uh, you know, a theater company 
uh, afloat and, and, and the commissions that we had going, Mabel Mind specifically, because um, we had some young artists that we had commissioned uh, as part of something called the Sweet Space. And, mm -hmm. and so when all of this changed, I found myself having to, um, not just alone, but with Mabel Minds, I uh, had found myself figuring out how to involve them in the idea of theater as, as a virtual performative project, which is, which is a wonderful and interesting thing. I mean, to imagine that theater, because of the world that we're living in right now, theater cannot happen in the way that we're used to. We're used to it being a very social thing, a very tangible thing. We're used to it being about a building. And if you, if you subtract the idea of the building or the structure or the architecture of theater from the performative aspects of theater, then what do you have? Well, you still hopefully have ideas. You still have creativity. You can still have performance. Um, you still can have um, exchange, but it might happen via internet. You know, it might have to happen through live streaming. And that's what we've been doing. So I acted in a, a piece that was uh, live streamed on Zoom, directed by Regina Taylor, um, called uh, Love and Kindness During Quarantine with a bunch of playwrights. Um, I'm, I'm now trying to structure this program that we're working, that I'm working on with these young artists uh, who are supposed to perform their work live at Mabel Minds. Um, mm -hmm. Now we're changing it so that they can figure out how to adapt their own performative pieces uh, for video so that we, so that, so that people can see it in, in this medium, you know, and, and to encourage them and to, and to let them understand that actually there is some, something wonderful about this. Uh, because when you go to see a play, usually it's, uh, you buy a ticket to see a play and, and whoever's in that theater to see that play at that moment are the people who are witnessing that play. Well, we have another opportunity right now. And the opportunity is that if we're doing it through Zoom or doing it through, you know, social media, uh, there's an opportunity that many more people than are inhabiting the same space can actually witness a work live. Do you know what I mean? So it's so it's, so it's like so I, so one can one can actually have a play online that is broadcast in Los Angeles and that is you know broadcast in you know like live television. I mean it's like you know it's all all over or all over the world that anyone can access you know at the same time and can write and can actually even um, you know chat if they wanted to you know, um, and, and, and respond or, or have responses to the thing that they're seeing. Uh, it, so it, it, changes, it changes how we approach theater and, I'm, and I've been challenged to, to try to, you know, work very hard with uh, mm -hmm. a bunch of like-minded people who are involved in that process for right mm -hmm. now. Well, it will be interesting how you and Mabu Minds and that space that PS said the Provence space, how you would answers you will find and uh, I think everybody is uh, looking is uh, interested artists also need to work they need to encouragement I think uh, most of all and uh, this is something you you do um, did, did, did something change for you uh, in this time did, did you the time you spent with yourself as you said to look at did something did you find something that's different now um, after uh, yes, I mean, I, I certainly, I think I found that there were, um, and maybe not unlike many other people, I found that there were um, people that had not, because of the quarantine and because of this isolation, I found that um, there were some people who I had somehow had now had no way of getting in touch with, uh, you know, for whatever reason. Uh, and, and some of those people were very unnecessary in my life, uh, you know. Prior to the quarantine, there, I was, you know, and, and what I mean by that is that there, is that when 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 everything is available to you, you tend to consume everything. You know, if you if you're, you know, again, Epicurean. If you if you're if you're mm -hmm. if you're passionate about 
anything in about <laughs> Pleasanter. And so uh, it's restricted. It's restricted, you know, who I can actually identify of uh, and identify as or think of as, you know, family and friends and the people that I actually need in my life um, and, and, and the people who I define as part of my coalition. So that's been wonderful to begin to redefine, you know, uh, my own coalition principles, to redefine um, my own objectives, to redefine my own personal goals for the future, to redefine uh, the books, redefine um, how I manage time or have mismanaged time and to, uh, you know, allow myself the time to read the books that I haven't read and that I intended to read, uh, to learn the things that I needed to learn, um, to reach out to people, and also to, to try to help people, I guess, psychologically, because that's, that's been also part of the process. Part when, when the quarantine first happened, I was ending the school year and I had to teach my college students in this forum, which was new to me and new to them. And many of them were dealing with depression, clearly. And they were, you know, young students who were dealing with just, you know, feeling depressed about what was happening. And so some of the, some of the, the, the syllabus in a way kind of went away um, or was sacrificed for psychotherapy sessions, you know, you know um, where I, I became the listener or, or, or I, moderated or I tried to encourage um, the conversation um, and then lead it back to what we were really there to discuss and learn. But, uh, but it, it, it sort of rebranded and even changed how I teach that teaching has a personal level to it. Um, you know, that, that, being, that, that, that teaching in academia should always have a very, you know, that, that it should have a very personal um, level to it, that you should pay attention to the people that are in the room that you are teaching and actually care about them in the moment um, mm -hmm. so that they're able to understand what you're trying to impart to them. So it's changed it's my values. My values have been adjusted and are adjusting. My, um, my objectives are adjusting. Um, my sense of self and identity is adjusting, not shifting, not changing. I'm not becoming anyone else. I'm still Carl Hancock Rux. You know, I will still be a writer when this is over. Um, if I survive this, I will still be who I am. Uh, but how I perform my identity and perform my, 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 my many roles in the universe uh, has been absolutely adjusted. And in that way, no different than what's happened in the past. Because when I was, when I lived through the HIV AIDS pandemic, you know, and my older brother died and half of my, half of the kids in my high school died, it absolutely adjusted and how I lived, you know, it, it thrusted, I was thrust into a world. You know, made me get out of this country. It made me, you know, go to the University of Paris. It made me go to the University of Ghana at Lagone. It made me um, decide to become an artist uh, because I didn't know how long, you know, I would live or how long any of us would live. And I didn't want to be, you know, 20 years old um, and having died uh, without having expressed myself or articulated myself. You know, there's almost, there's this, there's a, there's, there, there's a saying that, it's not a saying, but there's a, there's something that someone very important said to me one time, and I always say this, and I'll, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll repeat it, but it's a, a quote by uh, Dr. Bernice Johnson Regan, who uh, is an anthropologist and who is a singer and who's the founder of Sweet Honey and the Rock. Many years ago, she said to me, um, when we worked on a project together with the director Robert Wilson in Paris, uh, she said to me, there comes a time in your life when you discover an emptiness. You have no thought of yourself as being empty. And in fact, you've been operating as if you were not. But there it is, this emptiness. And when you discover it, nothing hurts as much as that emptiness, except your yearning to be full. And that's when, for the first time in your life, 
And the first time with your life, you search for a tongue, a language, a means of articulation. And that's what happened to me through the HIV AIDS pandemic. That's what's happened to me in this Black Lives Matter movement. Uh, that's what's happened to me with this um, coronavirus pandemic, um, constantly becoming aware of one's emptiness, the emptiness that you uh, had been ignoring or, or um, you know, uh, not treating, you know, uh, and so and 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 uh, and 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 in and in discovering it, you then have to deal with how to heal it or cure it or fill that space, and in finding ways to fill the space of your own emptiness that you discover, and that can only come with personal self examination. Um, you finally start to develop or yearn for a, you know, a, a, an articulation of, 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 of ideology and of, of, and of, and of, and of feelings and of, um, you know, uh, an articulation of being that, that, that you had never, ever considered before. And so th this, this becomes incredibly important. You know, um, I think that every moment that challenges us, another moment, another statement I should say that she said once is that life's challenges are not meant to paralyze you. They're supposed to show you who you are. And so I don't, I do not feel paralyzed. I don't feel paralyzed in this moment. Um, I feel like I am finding out who I am. And I hope that for the rest of my life, I will constantly be discovering who I am. And not only me, but I hope that we will always be forced against a wall to discover who we are and how we are communicating with each other and what we are saying to each other and whether or not we are paying attention to each other's socioeconomic um, you know, uh, 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 realities and race realities and gender realities. Um, you know, how are we interacting? Who are we voting into governance? Who are we supporting? who are we not supporting that should be supported? What do we understand about capitalism? What do we understand about socialism? What do we understand about some kind of an ism that we've never heard of before, but could possibly be invented that could actually be a new way for society to, um, to, 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 to manage itself. So uh, this, is, this is a really important moment. And I think this moment cannot be taken lightly for any of us not for any of us. We cannot take this moment lightly. We are being forced to think about injustice. We are being forced to think about family. We are being forced to think about health. We are being forced to think about racism. We are being forced to think about police brutality. We are being forced to think about uh, you know, uh, the prison system. We are being forced to think about our own economy. We are being forced to think about how we spend our time. We are being forced to think about who we spent our time with prior to this moment. We're being forced to think about whether or not there was any value in that at all. We're being forced to think about um, who we need to spend time with should we survive this moment. We're being forced to think about survival. We're being forced to think about the media of our existence. And if we really pay attention to that, if we really commit ourselves to that, if we really challenge ourselves with all of those things and more, we personally could actually come out of this moment finessed and um, absolutely, absolutely changed in the most magnificent way. I would hate to think that any of us would just hide away hope maybe we don't you know, catch the virus um, and hope that maybe nobody throws a brick through our windows because of the, you know, the Black Lives Matter movement. Uh, and then when it's all over or when it seems like it's all over, just go back to our way of living and walking down the street and living in our own shelter and living in our own bubble uh, you know, uh, and ignoring everybody else's needs and ignoring all the people around us. If we do that, then we've, then we've, we've missed this gift. This mm -hmm. is a gift. 
this moment is a gift. And I, that's how I perceive it. I perceive it as a wonderful gift from the universe. Even, even with, the, you know, I'm, and I don't mean to make light of anybody who's died or has lost anyone or who's been sick. I'm not, I'm not making light of that. But uh, one must embrace the positive and the negative in order to understand that there is something still to do with all of it. Every wound, every death, every sickness, every challenge, every upheaval comes with something to teach you something, to understand something about mm -hmm. yourself in the future. Yeah, yeah and that's, that's, uh, that's a significant uh, realization. It makes me think there's this little brighter poem of story of Mr. K. He wrote middle, lots of little stories and Mr. K meets a friend the friend looks at him and said, oh, you haven't changed at all. And Mr. K turns pale, turns around and walks away, you know, and he, he's up. So maybe this is a moment in Corona. Yeah. yeah, how sad that would be. How sad that would be. Oh, you haven't changed at all. Someone that, you know, that's so great you said that to me. Someone asked me that. I was walking down the street yesterday with my mask on, and I, and, and I saw a friend, and she, from across the street, and of course we kept our distance, and, you know, she said, hello. And I was like, hi, how are you? And, and, and she said, uh, I said, how are you? You know, and so she said, oh, I'm, we're talking through our masks, you know. Mm -hmm. And then she said, um, she was telling me that her birthday was coming up. And I was like, oh, congratulations. And then she said, oh, you know, do I look any older? Do I look any different? You know, and I, I said, no, you, you know, you look fine. But I was just trying to compliment you. Yeah, I didn't want to make, you know, I mean, and she didn't. I mean, she, looked, she looked absolutely fine. But I thought about that and I was like, well, actually, I know what she was asking me. Did she did she look like, had she aged, had time aged her, had this, uh, you know, this moment of sheltering, has that aged her, you know, has it taken away? And she's a very beautiful woman, but I guess, I, it, it, so I guess there was some vanity to the question I'm going to assume. And, mm -hmm. you know, in this, uh, do I look any different when she was asking me that? And, uh, I, I, I almost wanted to go back to her and say, shouldn't you look different? You know, shouldn't you look a day older? Shouldn't mm. you? Not weathered, you know, not beaten down, but mm. shouldn't you be, look a little wiser, look a little smarter? You know, is, shouldn't there be a little frow line here that you didn't have before that you now, that you now really embrace and it's wonderful? I mean, let's think about that. I mean, let's think about just, you know, the, the before this moment, you know, of, of what we were doing to ourselves and to our bodies, even in American and, 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 and all, all kinds of cultures, right? The idea of uh, Botox, the idea of paralyzing our faces with venoms that would uh, render us expressionless, you know, all as a way to cheat, you know, time, you know, and, and to, to help us believe or think that we actually looked younger than we actually were. Um, why would we, or why should we? And I'm not making a judgment necessarily, but I'm, mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm using this really as more of a metaphor than anything. Why should we paralyze ourselves from the events of our lives? You know, we should not. You know, we should wear them proudly on our faces if we can. Yeah, yeah. You um, you mentioned students. I think you teach at Yale, right? If I'm uh, if I'm right. How well, do I'm a, no, I don't. So I don't teach Yale right now. I was teaching at the New School, and I was also teaching uh, with uh, uh, NYU Stella Adler, uh, vo uh, voice for actors. So that that. How did you them. How did you get into theater? What, when you said I'm, how did How did you start out as a kid and all of it tell us a little bit a long too long of a story my god but it, we have time we have time okay all right i uh, uh, i was uh my mother was paranoid schizophrenic um i was raised in the new york city foster care system i was adopted by my grandmother's brother and his wife they were much older than me my grandfather my my so it was my grand uncle and his wife who adopted me my grand uncle I uh, was born in 1915. My grand, his wife was born in 1923. They'd been born and raised in Harlem. Uh, they were music enthusiasts and they loved jazz music and had lived through all the great 
eras of jazz in Harlem. Uh, so I was living with people who were generations older than me and who uh, were, you know, something like, I, I, I like to think of, I, I like to think of them as, um, they were sort of like ethnomusicologists. Every Saturday night, they would pull out their records, their vinyl records and play music and uh, force me to listen to, you know, Miles Davis and Coltrane and things that I didn't understand. And they would listen to it with the ear in, in, in such a way that um, was very strange, spooky, almost uh, I, I, to me at the time, because they would, you know, say things like, oh, did you hear what the sound that horn made? Did you, did you, did you, did you, ooh, did you understand, you know, how, the, you know, the, 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 you know, the, the tonality, you know, of that saxophone? Did you, ah, oh, you know, as, 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 as if, as if these instruments, you know, the, the, this instrumental jazz music was actually speaking language to them and that they were having a conversation with, you know, th this, this music. And I thought it was the strangest, weirdest thing in the world, but it was also a fascinating thing. Um, uh, they, were, they, were, they, were, they were artists and they were thinkers. Um, I uh, began to, I think, listen to music and then listen to the world that way. And also, uh, as uh, you know, when I was very young, I was, I think in elementary school, I worked with, uh, I, I was in a young actors program, worked with a woman named Nima Barnett, who is a, a well-known African-American female director still uh, in Hollywood, uh, the first African-American female director to direct primetime television. But at that time, she was heading a, a, a children's theater company and I was working with them uh, just trying to, you know, come out of my shell and um, embrace myself and, 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 and deal with my, you know, um, you know, my existence and, and try to interact with other children. I loved it, loved the idea of theater, loved the ideas of plays, loved the idea of um, reading plays. My mother was an avid reader. So I was, you know, nine and 10 years old reading the books that were on her shelf, everything from Baldwin to Jean Genet to Hemingway to, Ralph Ellison to Richard Wright, um, and she would encourage this, and this was very important to her that I would, you know, read these things. Um, um, in fact, even reading theory or or, or philosophy, uh, uh, you know. So this was, even though I didn't quite understand it, and was probably too young to understand a lot of it. But um, the more I read, the more I fell in love with language, and then um, as I um, so there's the, the so there's two things happening. One is I was being taught to listen to language that uh, was nonverbal by my parents, right? So nonverbal language, which is which is music. Then at the same time, I was being taught to participate in language, uh, which was theater, which is performance. Um, and to allow the language that someone else had written to come into my body and into my mouth and out of my mouth and to perform it. And then I was also being taught to read language and comprehend language and perceive language and sit with it silently um, uh, and to become fascinated and to see what it did to my psyche and to my soul. And this is all before I'm 12 years old. So um, I knew that I wanted to be a writer. And I, um, even though I was very, very attracted to all of the art forms, I mean, I was in I was visual art, dance, I was, in, I was attracted to all of it, but I knew I wanted to be a writer. Went to the LaGuardia School for Music and the Performing Arts as a visual artist, strangely enough, um, because I felt like I, I, I understood the other mediums and I wanted to know something more about drawing. And there I'm being taught the language of seeing and interpreting and making with my hands, the language of color, the language of you know, shape and shadow, uh, the language of drawing and painting, you know, the language of, 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 of linseed oil and paint and smell and all these things you know what is that to make an object to sculpt even you know i mean that is that is the discourse so uh that was it was, it was an incredible thing and then also at that time there were people around me in that school who were singers and actors and i'm listening to these incredible young students who are 
singing the most beautiful songs, um, arias, classical music, uh, Negro spirituals, jazz, uh, Broadway show tunes. Um, that's what was happening, just like in the movie Fame. I mean, uh, the, and then there, were, and then there were these dancers, these kids walking down the hallways in their in, in their in their tights and their ballet slippers, and I couldn't stop watching them, you know, articulate um, something with their bodies. And I was learning the language of kineticism. I mean, really, the language of you know what the how the body can actually speak, you know, uh, non verbally. But but speak you know by, by by just using your limbs and your muscles and stretching your limbs and your muscles, um, uh, you know that every position that we make, you know, and and is is itself a sentence, um, which is which is true of of, of all language. Um, language is not just the sound that comes out of our mouths. And this made me passionate about the arts. I then went to um, the. Uh, I went to Columbia College, I went to the American University of Paris, and I went to the University of Ghana at Lagone. But I did not become a professional artist until, with all of those things that I had been, that the universe had been preparing me for, I didn't become a professional artist until that pandemic, that HIV AIDS pandemic, uh, had affected the life of my older brother, and I, I was working for the city of New York in a, a, a child welfare administration and working with a lot of social workers. And I was also working as a social work trainer. So there was a, there was, and, and that's what I partially studied actually at NYU actually was uh, the social work because I wanted to understand something more about like, you know, the politics of the world and the politics of, uh, you know, um, of, 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 of society and how we get through them and, and how we, how we mandate change. And when my brother became very ill, uh, I became his advocate. I, I had to become the person who advocated for his healthcare, uh, who advocated for his hospital stay, who advocated for um, his shelter, who, adv who advocated for his food, who advocated, you know, he, was, he literally was losing his mind. He had dementia um, and, and, and I loved him, I adored him. He was, he was 20 years older than me, but, um, he was a, a beautiful, beautiful, wonderful man who had been stricken by this horrible, horrible, horrible disease and could not help himself and was withering away. So I had to sort of put down all of these, you know, aspirations and goals and actually sort of join the world and figure out how does the world operate? What does the world do? Um, and who am I? And, 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 and how do I find out? how to become an advocate for my brother. And in becoming an advocate for my brother, I think I learned how to become an advocate for myself and how to become an advocate for other people as well. Um, and after I lost him, when he died, and I shouldn't say that, I shouldn't say lost him because I didn't lose him. He physically died. I gained him. As I continued to gain him, and I mean that in a psychic way, um, uh, I, entered this realm of becoming a playwright because I wanted to commemorate him. So my very first play, which was done on 44th Street, 9th Avenue in Manhattan, was about him. And it was not just about him, but was also about um, all the black young men who, and women and people who were living, you know, it was almost like a, uh, the play was called Song of Sad Young Men. It was directed by Trezana Beverly, but, and it was sort of like a, um, uh, um, you know, it was a bunch of people in a bar, you know, pontificating and talking. Um, um, and it was uh, sort of a lower depths kind of play. Uh, and, you know, uh, in, in where, you know, these, these people are living in this this structure that's, uh, very dark, and they're living through very dark and dangerous times, and they're 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 facing each other and facing their own mortality and dealing with each other, and that's really how I entered um, professionally this realm of art making, of becoming a professional artist as a way of commemorating my brother, who had just died, um, because I didn't want to die without having 
said something about my existence and my life and about him and the lessons that I had learned. And then on and on and on. You're strangely quiet. No, no, that's. Uh, <laughs> tell a bit more how you. What, what do you? What, what, why theater? You really, I, if I understand, it could be drawing. It could have been social work. It could have been perhaps movement uh, or music. That's true. That's you know, music. True. Why theater? Because I because I knew that theater because I knew that theater actually would be the one form that uh, well I knew that I wanted to be a writer first and foremost and the other reason is that theater was the only form that I could think of that was accessible to me that actually brought all those things together for me you know so in theater I could have music in theater I could have dance in theater I could have visual art in theater I could have color. In theater, I could have singing. You know, in theater, I could have language. You know, um, so you know, it, it, it was possible. Um, you know, I, in, in in visual art, uh, as I had learned it, uh, I did. I, I had not learned. I had not learned to be a visual artist as a performance artist, as a perform as a performative visual artist. So I didn't know anything about you know performative visual art. So that was not. I was not aware of that. That's. I'll just say that. Um, uh, even 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 in learning to train and to sing, um, which I did, I sang with the Harlem Boys Choir, and uh, studied voice. I had not, um, I had not, I had learned a lot about singing and 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 and, and, reading and, 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 and how wonderful that could be. But um, somehow I wondered whether or not singing was enough. It, it was, and it was, you know what? It wasn't enough for me. It wasn't, it wasn't quite enough. But in theater. Theater offered this possibility of bringing all of these things into the room, and and that's what I wanted to do, and that's what I was able to do, and that's what I did, mm. and continue to do. You mm. know, I mean, it's why it's why it's why working with uh, you know people like what, you know I've I've worked with when I was telling you about Bernice Johnson Regan and having worked with her. Well, the piece I was working with her on was an opera that. Um, I, I was performing in uh, Temptation of St. Anthony. We were touring all over Europe and it was directed by Robert Wilson. And so people uh, know Robert Wilson as this great, you know, um, avant-garde, you know, theater director, uh, which he is, but, you know, he, he, he's more than that. You know, I mean, he, you know, he went to Pratt to study visual art and, 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 and more than that, he was also studying, um, uh, Architecture, or you know, you know, the notion of you know building and structures, you know, and 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 then shapes, right? Um, and and then more than that, you know, because of his own personal life, um, he was thinking about how theater communicates in very simple ways, uh, or or in or in um, uncomplicated, I should say, uncomplicated ways, complicated but uncomplicated ways. Uh, you know, while being very colorful, you know, but 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 it didn't it didn't necessarily have to be a heightened language, you know. So he, that's something that he has spoken of greatly about how he's drawn to, uh, even in his blocking or his directing, you know, uh, you know, very almost box like, you know, um, actors on stage, you know, the movement, um, which is his own dance, you know, like Kabuki, or it's his own dance of um, simplicity in order to mimic or interpret humanity. Uh, and then because of art, he's, you know, he, he, he's, he's, he's this brilliant, brilliant, brilliant theater director and lighting designer who then saturates the stage with all of these colors and takes you into a world you've never seen. Also, I had gone, when I was a teenager, I was, um, uh, I was accepted into a program called the Harlem Youth Writers Workshop. Um, uh, and it was led by a man named George Davis, another man named Frank Dexter Brown. Uh, it was a way of teaching children, uh, teenagers, journalism. And it was actually housed at Columbia University and it was funded by the Xerox Corporation. And when I was there, I decided that I would become an arts writer because I was already in an arts world. And uh, so I thought that I would, you know, 
that that would be appropriate for me because each child you know made their own decisions about what they what kind of a journalist they wanted to be or how they would want to study journalism and i was like well let, let me let me try to understand arts journalism or arts criticism and so i was going to see plays and going to see broadway plays and in, and in seeing these broadway plays i was sucked into these worlds that, that were I, I i can remember it like it was yesterday just the beauty and the magic and nothing else did that for me not even film i the, the magic of knowing that i was in the same room as a, as other human bodies but the difference was that the other human bodies were on stage and i was in a seat and that the people who were on stage were um, in were walking in and out of light and were um, either singing or speaking or both um, and were telling stories to me in that room at that moment. And so there was an energy. There was something that was literally being passed from me. And it was just a few feet away from me. And if I wanted to, if I could, I could actually reach out and touch these people. You know, it's not on a screen. It wasn't technical. You know, it was technical, but it, you know, all theater, everything has its technology. But I mean, it wasn't, um, it wasn't, uh, no, there, there, there was nothing that distanced me from these people who were performing and telling me a story. And so that became magical to me that, I, that, that people like August Wilson could, could actually take me into 1930 something Pittsburgh. I'd never imagined being in, you know, I'd never imagined being in the 1930s and I'd never imagined what that looked like. And I never imagined what, I had no thought of what Pittsburgh was and, and didn't care or, or, that, or, that, or, that, or that any player, that anything could actually bring me in, in that mother courage could bring me to, you know, some, some, some realm of um, a society that I recognized but didn't quite recognize that Shakespeare could actually bring me into a world that I um, had no knowledge of yet realized, oh, I do have knowledge of Lear. I do have knowledge of Richard. I do know who Hamlet is. You know, I do understand that. Even though it was written, you know, half a millennia before I even came to this planet. And also, even though these writers, the playwrights, didn't know me personally, so many of these plays felt like they were personal gifts to me, that they had there were times, you know, it's almost like that song, you know, Killing Me Softly. No greater song in the world, I think, lyrically. Yeah, you know? No greater song in the world. Killing Me Softly with his song, right? I mean, that idea, you know, you know, I thought I heard a song, you know, this, this whole idea that, you know, it's almost like he'd read my diaries, you know, as, as, as had my diaries and, and, read, and read each one out loud. That's what theater was like for me, you know, mm -hmm. going to see a play. It was almost as if these playwrights had, had, had unearthed my diaries and were, and we're reading each one of them out loud in, in many different ways. And, and, and that the world was playing some strange, wonderful, magical trick on me that I was willing to um, take part in. You know, I was like, yeah, let's play. I'll, 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 be, I'll, I'll join this. You know, this is a, what a wonderful game. I mean, if this, yeah. if this can happen and can, 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 can continue to happen, I must be a part of this world. And so that's, that's how theater came into my life. I remember I see in Spiegel you spoke about um, Racine that you as a kid you would you know read it but you could imagine family structures because you didn't fully know you know your, your parents right and uh, that's an incredible yeah I think that's I think that I think that had a lot to do with it um, I think the fact that I was a foster child <coughs> who had been adopted who had no relationship with his with his biological mother um, whose history was really unavailable to me had no knowledge of my biological father was born was actually born I found this out recently that I was actually you know when my mother had me I was uh, it was while she was institutionalized I didn't know that by the way when I last talked to you I thought that um, that that her that her uh, mental illness, happened after sometime after I was born, but actually I found out recently that it happened before I was born. She was already institutionalized. It was, a, it was like a family secret. It was a thing that people were keeping from me for whatever reason, I have no idea, but they were keeping that with me. So I was, so she became pregnant while she was actually in the, in, in this, in this, you know, mental institution with me. Um, and uh, 
there was no way of finding out who my father was. Um, and no one pursued that. So I still don't know and won't know. Um, uh, so there, so I was a child with questions and question marks. And uh, again, that's it's like I said earlier, you know, so that uh, even, even the darkest, saddest things in our lives, we must learn to embrace. I mean, it's what Buddhism teaches us, isn't it? You know, I mean, that, that we, must, we must understand the balance of, of the mm -hmm. universe, right? That, that everything has a purpose and a meaning. And so um, I was a child who came into this world with question marks and um, didn't know how to articulate my questions, but certainly found a way to articulate my questions um, um, to find my own answers, maybe not specifically to who is your father or why your mother was, you know, paranoid schizophrenic or why I was born in a mental institution or, you know, maybe none of those answers could absolutely be answered, but what could be answered were um, larger questions. And it's just, and it's the greatest thing too about being um, an artist is that one question opens the box to the next question, to the next question, to the next question, you know, until you find a million and one answers that you had never even perceived um, finding in the first place. So. I, uh, yeah, that had a lot to do with uh, th th these question marks that was stamped on my soul and stamped on my psyche had a lot to do with becoming an artist. Mm. Yeah, and it's just, uh, yeah, and who, who, who we are. You were forced and thrown into it to really ask it existentially. And for many of us, somehow we seem these questions are answered, but perhaps they are not, you know, we just take superficial explanations, where do we come from, and uh, where are we, where are we going, and uh, what is a father, the idea of a mother and father and family, and uh, what is it? What's well, and, 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 and so many of us have that, I mean, so many of us have those questions about, mm. you know, it, it's almost um, a, it's almost a, you know, it, it, every, I think almost everybody questions, you know, oh, was my mother and father a good mother or father, or, you know, or did I have a, happy childhood or was everything okay or could things have been done differently or could things have been done better or or why did they divorce or you know whatever everybody everybody has a story about their family everybody has a family story you know and um but you know it, it, it's it, it's it's something to have it with you for your entire life and to allow it to um you know um to to, to push you further to investigate the world you know, I think that's it, it, to use it, to use it, to use those questions and to use those experiences, you know, whether you were adopted or not, whether you were a foster child like me or not, you know, I mean, but just to use your own experiences and your questions um, uh, is, 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 is very relevant and insurgent for all of us. Um, and, and, and to, and, but to use them, not just have them, because if we just have them, then we can die with them and they can actually increase our disease before we, and, and we die with them mm -hmm. and, and, and not help us. But if we use them, then um, we can actually sharpen our instrument and do something while we are here because we're only here for a certain time. And so um, that's what, learning and that's what investigating and learning about my own personal history did for me it made me and continues to make me sharpen my instrument or instruments my weapons my armor my language my polyglot my linguistic my mind my interactions yeah. Yeah, my perceptions yeah, and as you pointed out, this time of Corona is something where it forces us, and it might be something that will save. save well, if it doesn't, if it doesn't, then we've then this is if it doesn't, then we've we've got not, we've got nothing from it, right? I mean, if, if if we don't if we don't if we don't do any, if we don't do something with this moment, then it's lost. A bunch of people have died for what? Nothing. Mm -hmm. And I don't think anybody wants that. I mean, you know, and maybe you, maybe there are people who have a very hard time believing the existential. Uh, you know, or, or the spiritual and, you know, the idea of, you know, sort of questioning things, the larger world or, the, or trying to see the greater picture. But um, I can't help but do that. Um, and and uh, I, 
And I can't think that every single moment that we are on the planet, we are here to learn something to actually increase and better the planet and the place and the moment and the people that inhabit the earth. And so if we don't do that, if we don't use this moment for its purpose, then we've, we've, we've really failed the class. Yeah, and then we are really lost. Um, but today I got a mail from Tom Walker, who's a long-standing member of the Living Theater, and he wrote a poem about the evil that surrounds us. And he said, theater is not a mirror. He said, again, this old image of, you know, Goethe, you said, it's kind of forgers. We have to, theater has to engage now and, and has to okay, promote people to act. What, what do you, how do you see theater? How do you see your theater? What does it do? Well, I mean, I think I think I was always I, I I after having seen a lot of theater and lot, lots of different kinds of theater, I I was very I think I became clear that I was not into, um. Well, I shouldn't say that 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 the kind of theater I wanted to make was not going to be naturalism necessarily. You know that it wasn't you know that it wasn't going to be a you know um. Kitchen table kind of you know naturalism or realism. You know that that I was interested in theater that, uh, you know, was abstract to some degree or or experimental, for lack of a better word. Um, uh, you know that that that, that joined, um, you know, different mediums, uh, and 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 came up with something um, that I had not seen or uh, or or not been witness to. Uh, almost in that way that Toni Morrison says. Um, you know, write the book that you that you that you have not read or that you want to read. You know, so um, so I, I wanted to write the play that um, that I had not seen and that I wanted to see, and um, and and hope that maybe there'd be another me out there in the audience who, um, you know, that, that the kid that was me long ago that uh, leaned forward and said, you know, maybe. Everybody in this room isn't getting this, but I'm getting it. I I, I feel this. So uh, I'm 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 so I'm a I'm a I'm a I'm I'm passionate about history. I'm passionate about the moment. I'm passionate about the existential, as you can tell. I'm passionate about the the abstract. I'm passionate about language, um, and I'm passionate about um, ideas. You know, and I, I, I've I've always been passionate about ideas. Uh, I think that the theater is a place for discourse, and actually. What I've learned, sorry to uh, make my computer move. What I've learned is that that's what it always was. You know, that it always was meant as that. It was not simply for entertainment purposes. You know, um, there, was a, there was a level to it uh, in the ancient Greek theater where, where it may have been propagandi propagandistic to, 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 the, to the degree of, um, you know, forcing us to believe one thing or another regarding you know, who we, you know, what gods we followed or, you know, what armies we followed. But on another level, um, it was forcing us toward our values and, and forcing us toward ourselves and forcing us toward something spiritual. So it's, it, it began, this, this idea of theater, as far back as we know it, because I believe it, I believe it existed even before then, um, as far as we know it, um, uh, even with the ancient Greeks, um, was always political and social and spiritual and abstract and uh, dealt with the many realms of existence. And that's the kind of theater that I'm attracted to in a contemporary way. I always want Dionysus to be in the room, you know, always, you know. I need I need a Dionysian moment constantly, you know. Has I need I need a god to pay, to play some dirty trick on me or on a character in order for me to understand something. I need you know um, I need I need a city. I need Thebes, you know. I need um, I need to try to get to it, or at, le at least I need to try to save it. I need to be Pentheus. I need to be Pentheus in that way that um, I am a son, you know, and, and a warrior son, and that I am a warrior son who has serious conflict with his father. I need my father to be 
uh, some great mythic king possibly unavailable to me or in conflict with me or um, endangering me to some degree uh, only to or, or, or even trying to impede me only to compel me. I need love to be something that I have to kill the Minotaur for. You know, I need that. I need that. I need that. Um, I need to step into someone else's garments um, and, and perform the role of the other. That, that's what theater is to me. That, that is theater. That is absolutely theater to me. Um, that's the kind of theater that I absolutely love. You know, stepping into the garment of something I've never worn, being influenced by a God that I'd never known, challenging another part of my father. And when I say father, just creation, right? Um, challenging a part of, my, of the creation of the universe um, that I had not yet challenged. Um, salvaging myself and a city that I had not yet inhabited, or at least trying to get to a city that I've not yet inhabited. You know, those are, those are really important things to me. And, 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 and just architecture. I mean, strangely enough, for whatever reason. I'm, I'm passionate about buildings. I'm passionate about how buildings are structured. I'm passionate about um, the idea that rooms and doors are used for their emptiness. Thus, we're helped by what is not. So um, I'm, 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 I'm passionate about entryways that let in air, let out air, or trap air in. I'm passionate about derelict buildings and old buildings that trap history and spirits and ghosts. I'm passionate about the stories that even plaster and molding can tell us, and stone and marble, rocks. I'm, passion I'm passionate about the texture of rocks and wood and stone um, because they all represent something so much older than I am. And they have a story to tell me. And so that, that, that's why theater. It feels less manufactured in a way than for me than I guess film or television. And I don't mean that I don't love film or television, but I do mean that theater is the oldest form. It, it precedes these forms. You know, it birthed those forms, right? It birthed film, it birthed television. But so, you know, why not go to the source? Going back to the source, for me, there's nothing like the source, the source of the thing, you know, that, 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 that artistic beginning, you know, that, that, that form that, that teaches us more than we could ever possibly know from its offshoot, you know? And so, that, so well, that's why theater for me. Do, do and that actually, that? and also, sorry, oh, I was gonna say, and that also, you know, I can hate it or love it, you know? I mean, how great is that, you know? And then I can, and then I can, I can, I can, you know, or that I can walk out in an intermission and not understand it. My favorite moment, you know, I think that I always get wrong and I, I think I need to learn how to quote this, but I know I've read this, is in Proust, you know, um, um, you know, where, where there's a character who sees a play and decides that he hates the play, you know, um, and you know he just can't stand it. And he's sitting there, he's watching the play, and he's like, "Oh, this is awful! Oh, this is oh, this is intolerable! I can't take this." And then um, um, he, but he waits, you know, he waits until the play is over, and he leaves. And as he's, as he's walking through the street, you know, um, he suddenly remembers something that someone said in the first act, you know and thinks, oh, what a clever statement that was. And, and, and he remembers something about the garment or the dress, you know, that the, that the actress wore, you know, in the second act and how beautiful that garment was and how it flowed and how the light hit it, you know? And he remembers something about um, the relationship between the one character and another character. And suddenly in the middle of the street, as he's on his way home, leaving the theater that presented the play that he thought he hated, he learns, he loved, you know, he suddenly discovers that he actually loves the play because he's gotten to live with it and learn it and question it and hate it 
and learn to love it and to allow it to, you know, uh, have some real, some, some real relationship to his thinking mm -hmm. and being. Yeah. yeah, theater, theaters, you know, it's 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 this um, passionate, strange, crazy, mystical world. In the same way that you know, almost like you know, church or you know, I I'm, I love the theater of things. I mean, I love the theater of. I was talking to someone else about how much I love the theater of Catholicism. You know, I don't. I'm not Catholic. I don't know that. You know, but I I don't I don't know what these incense things are, but I think they're beautiful. I mean, my God, you know, when you, when you see these things, that are, you know, and, and the priests have got this, you know, this, you know, even in a movie and you see it and, it, and it's got, I don't even know what to call it. That's how dumb I am. But I mean, you know, they're, they're, this, this lovely brass, you know, thing, whatever, with the, with the smoke coming from it and whatever in there, and it's on a chain. Who invented that and why? You know, and, and what does that represent? Is that supposed to represent the spirit? You know, who invented the garments? You know, of the of the, the these priestly garments, these robes, these these colors, you know, these songs, you know, espiritu. What are they singing? Who are they singing to? What are the songs of the angels? Where are the angels? What are the angels? I don't. Are they here? What are those? Who are those people, made in glass, that are windows? Really, nothing more than glass. In, in, in window frames, but colored glass, reflecting light into a space. So that, um, but forcing me to look up at them and see them and ponder um, who they are and what stories they're telling. I mean, I love the theater of rituals. I love the theater of, of like I said, of, of church, of rituals, of dance, you know, and that's all of these things of theater for me. Mm -hmm. Conversation is its own theater. And I love the theater of conversation. Even though I, I tend to dominate it sometimes like I'm doing right now, but I, but I, love, to, I, love, I love the theater of you know, conversation, yeah. I look at people and I'm fascinated with them and I can't stop. I, I, I was the kid who, you know, were, you know my, my, my mother would have to, you know, slap my hand a little bit because I would stare at people, you know, I, I, I just stare at them for whatever reason, because I wanted to know who they were behind everything. You know, I would look at you and, you know, like, wow, you can look at you right now. You know, I mean, I, I could easily just sit and st stand and stare at you all day and wonder about your story and wonder about the country you come from and wonder about why you part your hair in the middle and wonder about why you chose those glasses and wonder about, you know, why you're wearing that specific shirt and wonder about the white wall that you're sitting in front of, but knowing that possibly outside of the frame of this computer, um, the walls have to be, uh, must be uh, something else other than what I see. That they at least turn, or that they, or that they make another shape. That it's not just a flatness, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, that you know that 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 it's not just a flat plane that's behind you, um, and that maybe there's a picture to your right, you know, and maybe there's a desk to your left. And and I I wonder I can't help I I'm nosy, you know it's like it's like and 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 it's like Zora Neale Hurston, Zora Neale Hurston, you know it's it's why I it's why I believe in research, you know the 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 great um, anthropologist and novelist Zora Neale Hurston said that all research is is poking and prying with a purpose, and that's what I do I poke and I pry with a purpose, and the purpose is really that to understand something more about me. So I'm looking at you wondering who you are because I'm still trying to figure out something about who I am mm -hmm. and who we are yeah. okay. and our relationship to each other. Yeah, yeah, no, and this is a, this is a, you know, a important. This is a time where we can and should do this and where we can learn and see the world, uh, how this, how it really is. Uh, besides the fact how we process it, you know, become aware of the fact that with our own VR headsets, we are actually processing the world and everybody is in a way isolated and that we have to be able to get an idea for the different ways of understanding. It's really, really um, um, good to hear from you and to, to your, your reflections and what we're saying and we are over time and out of time. But uh, before we go, what inspires you? What are you reading at the moment or listening to what, or in Corona, what did you, what did, 
did something show up on the horizon you were surprised about? Um, oh, there was a, those are many questions. Which one do you want me to answer? What comes to your mind? Yeah. Um, well, the, so the uh, reading at the moment, uh, which answers also the surprise question, is that I was walking down the street um, the other day, and you know, people uh, in my neighborhood sometimes uh, put down they, on their, their stoop things that they're getting rid of, you know, cups yeah. or glasses or books. And I came across this uh, Patty Smith book um, that she uh, was writing about her time living in this neighborhood. Just uh, kids. Right, right, with, with Robert Mablethorpe. Mm -hmm. And and I, I had actually just seen a, the film, um, but um, I'm, I'm fascinated about that, that period in time and all the many people who've gone to Pratt and whatever. So uh, I picked that up and so I'm, I'm reading that um, uh, just because I picked it up and it called out to me. And, I, and, that, and I, I'm that way about books, you know? I mean, they, they, they have to call me. You know, I mean, and very rarely are they even suggested to me. I mean, they literally call me, you know? I'm also reading these essays by Toni Morrison. Um, and other than that, so those are some surprises. And then other than that, um, I'm researching. I'm researching some uh, things about uh, people, uh, about, well, you know, it's, it's, it, this is a continued research. I was researching last night for hours and hours and hours about Greenwich Village and about the Minettas, um, you know, Minetta Lane and Minetta Place, uh, and, and about the 19th century um, citizens who lived in that area and the people into the early 20th century and about the, you know, the, the, the little Africa that is no more uh, that once existed in that area. And then um, the, the, you know, the incoming of, you know, the Italians to America and um, dominating what we know as Greenwich Village, you know, the South part of Greenwich Village um, and that culture and all the many characters who uh, were, uh, prominent and, 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 and a part of the bohemian lifestyle of the 20s and the 30s and the 40s and the 50s in the Greenwich Village, um, in Greenwich Village, um, you know, and, 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 and what they were studying, you know, from Gurdjieff to, um, you know, uh, you know, just uh, to, to, you know, uh, uh, this, this notion of um, uh, uh, their, their journals and I mean that, I'm, and I'm researching that for a reason. I'm, I'm working on, a, I'm working on a project actually. So, mm -hmm. but that's yeah, that became, and I'm finding out things that I still had not found out. And I've been, I've been studying that and researching that for twenty odd years, and and thought that I knew everything there was to know. And I found things last night I never knew or maybe forgot. So it was, it was amazing. That is um, great. So this time maybe is a is a time to find out uh, what we never knew about or what we forgot and. Uh, and it was a really, really important and significant to hear from you, what lessons you draw, how you use it, what it means to you, and uh, how you create meaning. And I think we need that. Uh, it is a time where we are lost. And uh, as we are anyway in our existence, but, um, but we have to now, we are called to create meaning. There's no imposing structure for better or worse. I think it's better so, we don't need it, but uh, we are the ones now who have to do it. And you, you made a great contribution to that just for me. And I think I'm also sure for, for people who listen to it and artists and, and, um, and, and everyone. So really, really thank you for joining us. Uh, and Melanie Joseph has, why the hell haven't you talked to Carl yet? You know? And, <laughs> I love her to do. Yeah, I tried to, we, it, somehow we didn't fully connect. So it's great that you were here. Tomorrow we continue our, uh, our, our journey uh, listening to, to theater, uh, theater artists. Uh, it is uh, Philippe Ken who is uh, from, uh, from Paris, so runs the uh, Théâtre des Amandiers in Nanterre and, uh, and is involved in, in many things, significant things, and his practice of theater and uh, what he uh, calls of the, the, the small things or so little things. We will find out what, what he will say to us. Uh, Betty Chamier, a playwright, uh, she's moves but now between New York and San Francisco from the Arab American. Um, theater community and Friday we have Adelheid Rosen from the Netherlands in Holland where she is in Amsterdam really creating a, a stunning uh, uh, amount of, uh, uh, of work and, uh, and engaging with the communities and creating work that, that resonates with them. Actually Melanie will be there and talk with her. Um, they, they are 
people use this also as a way of connection and they have a, a relation with each other. So I hopefully this will also um, bring them closer together. Carl, really, thank you. It was uh, um, so significant and important to, to hear from you. Thank you for taking the time and um, I can't wait to see your next play or the one about or your work or opera or where you act in. And so, you know, stay, stay tuned, stay connected to us, to our listeners. Really, thank you for taking the time. Uh, what uh, Carl had to say to you is significant and it has an impact if you choose to do so. And uh, it might be something in there that changes you. Or maybe things have already changed just listening to him and observing him. It almost looks like it somehow also like a little uh, uh, Orson Welles shot. It could almost look like a ceiling and you are standing <laughs> and looking down to us where he had these, uh, you know, ceilings close to the actors. So it was, that was really, really uh, an important uh, contribution. Thank you for doing this and to our listeners for taking time out so much uh, we have to do so much is on our minds, so it means a lot that you, you are here with us. For HowlRound to hosting us um, and, uh, and to the Siegel team and the Siegel Center and the Graduate Center. So really, thank you. I hope um, um, you all stay safe, wear a mask. It's not a political thing. It makes common sense. Uh, we heard the story of a barbershop or two hair cutters got a clean bill, a negative test, but that was wrong. They were positive, but they had kept their mask on for two weeks. They kept cutting hair and nobody got it. So it really protected the people who came in with masks and that's my, it does work. And um, so um, let's, let's keep safe. Uh, so uh, stay tuned, love to hear from you soon and uh, see you all again and uh, all my best. And again, Carl, really, thank you. Thank you so much.